In our previous video, we discussed basic airway management, which included airway opening maneuvers like chin lift and jaw thrust, the use of oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airways, and bag mask ventilation. In this video, we will move into advanced airway management, which includes the use of devices such as the laryngeal mask airway, endotracheal intubation, and surgical techniques for securing the airway when basic methods are not sufficient. The first device in advanced airway management is the laryngeal mask airway or LMA. The LMA is a supraglottic device, which means it sits above the vocal cords rather than passing through them. Although there are different types of laryngeal mask airways, they all share a similar design. Each consists of a tube connected to a mask with an inflatable cuff at the end. When inserted, the mask sits in the hypopharynx and the cuff is inflated, creating a seal around the laryngeal inlet. This allows ventilation to be delivered effectively without the need for endotracheal intubation. Even in cases of difficult airway or failed intubation, the laryngeal mask airway serves as a valuable backup when conventional bag and mask ventilation is not sufficient to maintain the airway. Some advanced types of LMAs are specifically designed to allow intubation through them, and these are known as intubating LMAs. Despite the availability of different types of laryngeal mask airways, the basic insertion technique remains relatively the same. Preparation begins with selecting the correct size LMA according to the patient's weight and manufacturer's recommendations. The table here shows the size guide for LMA Classic and the Proceal. As for the insertion, the patient is placed supine in the sniffing position, which is often achieved using the triple airway maneuver. This maneuver helps align the oral, pharyngeal, and laryngeal axes making insertion smoother and more effective. We have discussed positioning in out previous video. At the same time, we must ensure that patient doesn't awaken during insertion. If necessary, sedation may be used to prevent gagging or movement. Prior to insertion, the cuff should be inflated and deflated to check for leaks and to ensure that it functions properly. Then, with the cuff fully deflated, a small amount of sterile, Water-soluble lubricant is applied to the posterior surface of the distal mask and cuff. The deflated LMA is held between the thumb and index finger, in the same way one would hold a pen or pencil, with the aperture facing the laryngeal inlet. The device is gently inserted into the mouth and guided along the hard palate and then the soft palate. Using the index finger at the junction where the tube meets the mask, Gentle pressure is applied to advance the device cephalat so that the posterior surface of the mask follows the curve of the palate. The mask should advance smoothly until it meets definitive resistance at the entrance of the esophagus, which indicates that the tip is correctly seated in the hypopharynx. At this point, the bite block of the tube should rest at the level of the patient's incisors. Once the mask is in position, the hand is released from the tube before inflating the cuff. The cuff is then inflated with air, typically beginning with recommended volume. As the mask seats over the glottic opening, the tube will generally protrude 1 to 2 centimeters out of the mouth. The airway is then connected to a bag valve apparatus. Adequacy of ventilation is assessed by observing chest rise, auscultating breath sounds bilaterally, and confirming with end tidal carbon dioxide monitoring. Once proper placement is confirmed, the LMA is secured with tape or another fixation method to prevent displacement during use. However, before attempting LMA insertion, caution is needed. The ROD's mnemonic helps guide this evaluation. R stands for restricted mouth opening, which can make insertion difficult. O is for obstruction such as tumors, swelling, or foreign bodies that block the airway. D refers to distorted airway anatomy, whether from congenital anomalies, trauma, or previous surgery. S stands for stiff lungs or cervical spine, which can limit neck movement or lung compliance and complicate ventilation. The patient must also be unconscious or adequately sedated to suppress the gag reflex before LMA insertion. 
There is also an increased risk of regurgitation in patients with prolonged prior bag mask ventilation. In those who are obese, pregnancy or who have upper gastrointestinal problems such as reflux, hiatal hernia, or a history of GI surgery or bleeding. Patients who have not fasted are also at risk. In emergencies, however, an LMA may still be used despite these relative contraindications. Finally, in patients who require high-pressure ventilation or PEEP, the standard LMA may not provide an adequate seal. In such cases, an endotracheal tube is preferred to deliver safe ventilation when there is significant airflow resistance in the lower airways or lungs. That is why endotracheal intubation is considered the gold standard of advanced airway management. It involves passing a tube through the vocal cords into the trachea, securing a definitive airway with a good seal. Compared with supraglottic devices like the laryngeal mask airway, Endotracheal intubation offers superior protection against aspiration, better control of positive pressure ventilation and tidal volume delivery, and is more reliable for prolonged ventilation. There are several major indications for endotracheal intubation. It is performed whenever a patient cannot maintain or protect their own airway, such as those with reduced consciousness after trauma, head injury, or overdose. It is indicated when airway protection from aspiration is essential. It is required in patients with inadequate oxygenation or ventilation despite other measures, for example in severe respiratory failure. It is also performed in the operating room for patients undergoing general anesthesia. In intensive care, endotracheal intubation may be performed prophylactically in patients with burns, facial trauma, or progressive airway swelling where early intubation prevents sudden airway obstruction. A structured airway assessment before attempting intubation reduces the risk of unexpected difficulty. We have covered airway assessment in detail in a separate video. One commonly used tool is the lemon mnemonic. L stands for looking externally at the patient for predictors of difficulty such as obesity, facial trauma, large incisors, or a beard. E refers to evaluating the 332 rule, which checks that there are at least three fingerbreadths of mouth opening, three between the mentum and hyoid, and two between the hyoid and thyroid notch. M refers to the malampati classification, which is assessed with the mouth open and the tongue protruded, grading how much of the oropharynx is visible. O stands for obstruction from swelling, infection, bleeding, or tumors. N stands for neck mobility, as reduced extension or flexion can make laryngoscopy more difficult. These elements help predict a difficult airway and allow the clinician to prepare alternative strategies such as a video laryngoscope, a bougie, a supraglottic device, or in extreme situations, a surgical airway. Preparation is essential for a successful intubation. Again, we have a detailed video about it on rapid sequence intubation video. The main point is that we should think of patients, equipment, drugs, backup plans, and team roles. For this, mnemonic like stop made can be used to ensure nothing is missed during the preparatory phase. The S stands for suction, which means having a functioning suction device with appropriate catheters ready to clear blood or secretions. The T stands for tools, which include the endotracheal tube of the correct size with smaller and larger alternatives, a working laryngoscope or video laryngoscope, a stylet or bougie, and a bag valve mask. The O stands for oxygen, which means ensuring effective preoxygenation of the patient and checking that a reliable oxygen source with delivery systems is connected and working. The P stands for positioning, which involves placing the patient in the optimal position for laryngoscopy, such as the sniffing position or a ramped position in obese patients. The M stands for monitoring, which means attaching the patient to pulse oximetry, ECG, blood pressure monitoring, and preparing capnography for confirmation. The A stands for assistant, which highlights the importance of having a trained helper who understands their role, whether it is passing equipment, applying cricoid pressure if needed. The I stands for intravenous access. 
which requires at least one secure and functioning IV line. Finally, the D stands for drugs, which means drawing up and labeling the induction agent and neuromuscular blocker, as well as preparing rescue medications such as vasopressors and analgesics. The ideal position is the sniffing position, with the head extended and neck flexed to align the oral, pharyngeal, and laryngeal axes. In obese we will have to use the ramped up position to achieve the sniffing position. If cervical spine injury is suspected, manual inline stabilization is performed instead. After the induction and paralysis, the laryngoscope blade is inserted into the right side of the mouth and advanced, sweeping the tongue to the left. For a Macintosh blade, the tip is positioned in the vollecula to indirectly lift the epiglottis, whereas for a Miller blade the epiglottis is directly lifted. The vocal cords are then identified, and an appropriately sized endotracheal tube is advanced through them into the trachea. In adults, the depth of insertion depends on the patient's height, but as a general guide it is usually about 23 cm at the incisors in males and about 21 cm in females. In children, formulas are available to guide both the selection of tube size and the appropriate depth of insertion. Once the tube is in place, the cuff is inflated and ventilation is commenced. Correct placement of the endotracheal tube is verified using multiple methods. These include direct visualization of the tube passing between the vocal cords, observation of bilateral chest rise and fall with ventilation, five-point auscultation, and the presence of a consistent and tidal CO2 waveform. Additional indicators are sustained improvement in oxygen saturation, visible condensation within the tube during exhalation, and radiological confirmation with a chest X-ray. In patients breathing spontaneously on a Bain circuit or a circle system in the open position, rise and fall of the reservoir bag may also be seen. Among all these techniques, continuous and tidal CO2 monitoring remains the gold standard for real-time confirmation in both operative and emergency settings. That's all for this video, in the next video we will discuss surgical airways.